All right, everyone, welcome back to the program. Uh, we're going to start with the second panel uh, on unrest policy and governance. And we're going to start with Dr. William Davis, who is the Associate Professor of Government and Foreign, Foreign Affairs at Walsh University, and also a 2005 Extension School graduate uh, with the ALM. And he'll tell you an amazing story of how his work here has fueled his succeeding work. He is, uh, his research interests include the influence of security threats and domestic politics on foreign and economic policy making. And his teaching includes a wide variety of classes in international relations and comparative politics, including international political economy, the European Union, and conflict resolution. So without further ado, Professor Davis. I just wanted to say, the, I, I got my ALM in, in 2005, and my thesis was uh, um, a story that had to do with foreign policy and partisanship as, a, as really a determinant of foreign policy. And really, it set in motion kind of for me, not only uh, uh, a new career, I was a stockbroker, I, and I got my PhD after having got my, my ALM. Uh, it was a catalyst, really. And it resulted in, you know, work that began in 2005 that has uh, essentially produced two published papers, and, and hopefully this, this paper here I can uh, I managed to get published as well. And, um, and now I'm a professor, so, you know, the rest is history, right? In any case, foreign policy doesn't, you know, in many ways uh, uh, rise to the interest level of some of the papers we've heard for, for most of us, at least not on the... Um, on the uh, uh, in, uh, you know on its face value. However, foreign policy really does kind of match and 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 fulfill the requirements of the symposium. That um, in in a sense that that good policy has good results, bad policy has bad results. And foreign policy really is kind of the sort of the sort of um, you know the will of a people in a sense. And my clicker is not working. Turn around, face the other. Ah, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Is it switched on? Maybe. Oh, it's off. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you. So it was off. Yeah, foreign policy, in a sense, what I'm trying to to yeah, next slide, uh, is that is the, is this in a sense the collective will of a people, in a sense, or the collective will of a tiny group among the people in some ways, at least according to some views. And so really what I'm talking about is the, the will to achieve foreign policy goals. And uh, most of them are, um, perhaps we would not recognize them immediately, but, but most of them really are accomplished through sheer will. And that means that, that, means that will is in a way tempered by power. You can only do what you you uh, can do foreign policy-wise if you have the power to do so. So, for example, the, the, the author, the great historian Thucydides 2,500 years ago, the author of, of the histori history of the Peloponnesian War, t you know, tells us what was true then is, in, in a sense, true today. That is, the strong do as they will, and the weak do as they must. We are strong. We are the United States. However, however our, our foreign policy is tempered by lots of other different things. And this is really what I want to talk about. So foreign policy, process of uh, bargaining and compromise among the world governments, 200 governments in the world can get pretty complex. You can, by mistake, do things you really didn't intend. So there's a lot of misperception among 200 world governments, a lot of, of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of outcomes that were not intended. If that were not the case, Iraq would be a democracy today. Libya would be a democracy today. So uh, intentions don't mean good outcomes. This is what I'm talking about, foreign policy. In any case, the puzzle that I'm trying to work out, the question is really, what do uh, outcomes and and uh, bad outcomes have to do with the minds of the people who fashioned them, fashioned the intent of the foreign policy. So for example, does ideology have a role to play? Is it a determinant of, 
of government policy, foreign policy specifically. Does government ideology affect foreign policy? You can look at, a lot of people says, a lot of people will ask that, ask that question and the answer seems obvious at first. Well, yeah, left-wing governments oppose war. Right-wing governments support war. So left-wing governments are, are oftentimes associated with dovish foreign policy. Dovish, I mean, pas, pas, you know, pacifistic or at least less hostile less aggressive, whereas hawks tend to be of the right. At least that's the assumption that seems to make sense for most people. I ask the question, uh, uh, does it? Well, sometimes it does. From the perspective of uh, foreign policy analysis, there are two big schools of foreign policy analysis in international relations, and they are the school of the realist and the school of the liberals. Liberalism, not to be confused with the liberalism we see on TV or that we're used to uh, among uh, uh, public uh, uh, discourse. But liberalism, in, in a sense, is simply the philosophy that is based in notions of human freedom and the notion that uh, we can achieve a better result, a better place, that in a sense, we're on a progression, a progressive trajectory towards a better place. And how do we get there? Smarter people. Harvard grads, right? Better institutions, more institutions, better institutions, and that somehow that can achieve better foreign policy outcomes, better world outcomes, better peace outcomes. And that's the one thing. The liberals uh, tend to say, for example, if we want to achieve those objectives that are achieved through human rationality and human intelligence and smarter policies, well, you, we're going to have to look at the domestic level to find those sources or those determinants of foreign policy. Those groups of people within your society or those institutions within your society, like the democratic institutions versus autocratic institutions, and those sorts of things are found at the domestic level. On the other hand, the realists have for long 50, 60 years have been dominated by a school of thought that said, no, actually, all states are in the same position. They're all in the predicament of having to survive in a hostile world. They all have to survive. It's easier for powerful states to survive than for weaker states. However, they all have that same basic function, survival. Now, how well you survive is really not a question for realists, because what they're saying is that all states will survive if, if, if they're powerful enough to do so. So the main organizing principle for these realists is power is the organizing principle of the world. And by the way, they think Thucydides was right. In any case, um, in any case, in this paper, um, it's easy to, to see how domestic influences would, uh, would dictate foreign policy positions. And the idea is, is, uh, is born out of uh, a type of a, 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 of a, of a liberal uh, uh, theory called, called audience cost theory. And audience cost theory simply says that political leaders all have to pay homage to their voters if they're a democratic country or the selectorate if they're an autocratic country, the oligarchs or somebody. That is that leaders really are simply the face of another group that they serve. And if they don't serve that group, then they're out. They're out. So they lose the election or they get or something, they're gone. Consequently, leaders tend to want to stay in power. They will therefore bow to the preferred uh, position of their um, of their uh, uh, audience. And so hawks prefer military options. Doves are going to prefer non-military options, uh, probably economic options. That's usually the, the way that that is argued. Um, in my paper, what I say is actually you need really both. You need both domestic determinants and you need the realist determinants of power too, because they work kind of hand in hand. And in a sense, I developed several hypotheses. I'm only going to go through the, the first one or two or whatever. And that is that as your 
the level of your hawkish, hawkishness of your government is going to be proportionate to the level of the hawkishness of the people who vote for you, or the selectorate, if that's the case. And I expected, if I test this, that I'm going to see a positive result. And I did get a positive result. There was no surprises there. However, if I look at economic coercion, I find that, that there's actually very little relationship. And, this, and um, this is kind of perplexing. Until I look at my second hypothesis, which was that hawkishness will become more hawkish, governments will become more hawkish as they become more powerful. And in the case of the United States, as the United States preponderance difference between its, between its um, um, uh, other countries gets to about 90%, the United States suddenly becomes the world's policeman. And this really tells you that, that it's not just a, a hawkish um, philosophy, and it's not just a hawkish, hawkish political principle, but it's really that in conjunction conditionally conditioned upon the level of power that your government happens to have. And that will change uh, the policy. So actually, in that, I get positive results, and they're significant. I test this empirically. And I get positive results, and they are significant at very high levels. So this tells me that this is a very strong relationship. So liberals and realists need each other to explain the real world, because in some ways, they only work conditionally on each other. Um, so, conclusion, I'll just zip ahead. The model here demonstrates that liberalism, audience cost theory, requires further study. Further study, why? Because it's empty without the function of power. It's a variable that's absolutely necessary to even explain state behavior. Without it, in my opinion, audience cost theory and liberal theories are lacking. Realism, however, also needs to look at the lower levels, the domestic um, the domestic uh, level of analysis in order to explain. And this is because while, while survival might be a function that is imposed upon the state from above, the state's reaction to its function is really the result of lower level decision makers who are blinded sometimes or misguided sometimes by their ideological preferences. Thank you. OK. Thank you very much. And now questions from the audience. So uh, given I'm also an international relations person, <laughs> you're getting the first question from me. Um, this seems all very interesting. And, and you know, I think you're right in terms of the realists and the liberalists need each other to actually explain the world as it is, not one is correct. Mm -hmm. um, but how do you get? policymakers who are the hawks and the doves to actually do this and to think about it this way and uh, look at your findings. Yeah, well, here's the thing. I, I, I study politics. I don't play politics. So here, here's the thing. It is for policymakers to make policy. University research institutes can provide them with the necessary information that they have. But if they don't take it, really, I mean, you, you know, this is a democracy. So on, this is the unfortunate problem with policy making, is they tend to be, policymakers tend to be true believers, right? And so they're blinded by their own ideological preferences. And they tend to seek out guys from the Kennedy School or from the Cato Institute or wherever who, who tend to already believe what they believe. And so they ignore alternate possibilities, which might inform their somewhat minimized or limited worldview. That's the best I can say. Um, it's kind of a comment as opposed to a question. I'll try to frame it as a question, but it's very related to this. So I'm looking at the last sort of 35 years of politics. Reagan was quite a liberal conservative, and it was frequently argued um, since the Reagan administration that the liberals, um, or the Democratic Party rather, was um, continuously borrowing the ideas of the conservatives such that the two parties eventually sort of melded together. So what was once a liberal conservative has now disappeared and has become a conservative liberal. And unfortunately, we have on the conservative side of the Tea Partiers, which to, uh, your sort of conservative conservatives things are, I think, are uh, excessively fringe, shall we say. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it's, it's that that idea that um, so that so your your ideas have been absorbed to a large degree 
by the current um, administration, but we still have, I would call them blind wars, where they just march in like Russia said, okay, we want the Ukraine, we're going to take it, and um, we don't care what you guys think. Well, my analysis is not strictly focused on the United States. I, I look at 40 some countries and uh, however the distinction between the united states and all of those other countries is huge and it's really because the united states is so preponderant we're head shoulders hips knees ankles above the rest and so consequently it gives us foreign policy tools that if we choose to use are available to us right. most of them we don't oh oftentimes like, we don't what are our most powerful foreign policy tools? um you mentioned uh, president obama and I guess you could say, uh, you were trying to say that he's fusing together. I know early on some people were saying he's well, kind of a realist. And, and then and now um, he's... Obama is sort of the next generation of Clinton. I mean, and I think it's a good thing. I think it's an enlightened uh, approach that this they've yeah. been melded. Well, uh, like I said, my, my focus was not really U.S. foreign policy. However, it sh the data shows that the U.S., because of its preponderant power uh, ratio between vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis other states, can choose other tools uh, in its toolbox of foreign policy tools that countries, other countries just don't, simply don't have. So, you know, Switzerland's not going to, um, you know, threaten Liechtenstein militarily or Germany. It's not going to happen, right? They may economically try to do something, they might do that, but they're not going to, because they simply don't have those tools. The United States has, a, you know, all the tools that exist in its box. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. You had the co column head in an earlier slide, uh, American dyad, I think it, yeah. was that dyad in a mathematical sense, a second order tensor, or is it some term, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a mathematical sense, but it all, it's simply in, in international relations and in politics refers to uh, pairs of countries, the United States and Canada, the United States and China, the United States. And, so it looks at all of these various pairs and, uh, and, 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 and mathematically, statistically, looks at the, the correlations, the relationships between them. So, yes. Uh, keeping your original framework, classical framework from Thucydides, yes. um, do you feel that the United States indeed does do as we will, and if we if we don't completely, who who are we beholden to? Whom are we beholden to, if if any nation? Anyway. You know, I could be wrong on this, but you know, it seems to me since World War II, the United States has had a, has had a dual pronged foreign policy. I I don't really address this in the paper, but since you both asked, you know, the United States has had a dual pronged foreign policy: security on the one hand. Play ball with us, or else, and a, and, and a trade policy on the other. So trade, so you have this realist sort of security arrangement with NATO, with ASEAN, with all the different kind of um, uh, allies. And then you have this sort of, you know, Kantian sort of liberal sort of trade regime. Play ball with us, you won't get hurt. Play ball with us, you get rich. <laughs> That's the deal. We open up our markets to you. Sell us your, your, your transistor radios and um, sell us your, 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 your VW bugs. You will get rich. Be nice to us, and you will get rich. And that does have a, a stick that can whip us in any way, or are we, are we pretty much sovereign in that way, in terms of you know, that's policy? A, all right, that's another good question, but uh, yeah, I guess so, but here's the thing. The United States is 5% of the world's population. We produce, and we have probably 20% of the world's stuff, plus. Our allies, the Europeans and the Japanese, add those guys. We, we, we dominate 50% of the world's material wealth. We could, if we chose to, be using other tools. I mean, not that we don't use a lot of coercive tools. We do. I'm not saying that. But I think we choose to have a world where we are somewhat restricted in what we could do if we were not a democratic country. So, getting back to those domestic determinants of foreign policy, if we were fascist Germany, would we use other tools? Probably. If we were ISIS, would we use other tools? Probably. So, we have the power, but it's mitigated 
in some way by our institutional structures, democracy, perhaps culture. I didn't look at that at all, but perhaps. So it's wide open. Just sort of going off of that, um, nuclear war uh, was, has sort of been taken off the table. That's not something you know that's acceptable to actually use any weapons. I'm not sure if you can really even threaten it anymore. Um, but I think going further than that, you you know, using military force for the most part is frowned upon. And while we might be able to, get, the, we the U.S. might be able to get away with it, um, I think you know if Germany threatened to invade somebody. Um, you know, they would just be, in a sense, put down, and it would be just such a negative reaction. Or if the French or English decided that they were going to go invade a country, the military threat is not quite as credible uh, as, you know, an economic one might be. And I don't know if you have Well, anything. Norman Angel uh, wrote a famous book uh, before 1914 where he predicted the end of military conflict. Uh, recent, not a uh, few years back, a guy at Ohio State, John Mueller, wrote a book. Uh, about how uh, war is becoming obsolescent within certain parts of the world. Um, however, the better example is possibly Russia and Crimea, right? I mean, uh, uh, John Kerry can tell uh, Vladimir Putin that he's on the wrong side of history all day long. And Vladimir Putin has Crimea. And so that matters to us. It may not matter to a future powerful country that doesn't care about our liberal values. And certainly Putin doesn't. Thank you very much. Thank you.